1 Kings chapter 19. I'll read the scripture in a moment. But let me remind you what's taken place and you're familiar what, with what has brought us to our text. Elijah has been at the brook Cherith. God has been preparing him and finally the brook has dried up and he's gone down to the widow's house. God said, go down to Zarephath. I've commanded a widow there to sustain thee. I, I'm, I've never figured this out. God said, I've commanded her to, but when he got there, she didn't seem to know anything about it. If you've figured that out, you could let me in on it after the service because I've been wondering over it. And then um, the Bible tells us about the miracles that took place. And then God has Elijah to go and have a contest with the prophets of Baal. And he says to the children of Israel, how long halt ye between two opinions? If God be God, serve him. If Baal, serve him. They answered him, not a word. So he said, we're going to have a contest. I want you to get you an offering, and I want you to pray to your God, and then I'll pray to my God, and the God that answers by fire will let him be God. And so they did so, and those prophets of Baal, they went through their gyrations, and they cut themselves, and they cried to Baal, but they got no fire because there is no God named Baal. And then Elijah repaired the altar and put the sacrifice on and had them to pour water in the middle of a drought, pour water over the altar. And he got down and he put his head between his knees and he prayed a 63-word prayer that would take you about a minute to utter. And fire fell from heaven, burned up the sacrifice, burned up the altar, burned up the water. And the Bible said when the people saw it, they said, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. And that Abraham slew for, or Abraham, Elijah slew 450 prophets of Baal on that mountain. My old friend Billy Goolsby said he made them a non-profit organization. <laughs> and then Elijah comes down off the mountain in victory and gets a letter from a woman. And it appears to me that sometimes it's a short distance between victory and defeat. And it doesn't take you long sometime to go from the top to the bottom. And when Elijah gets that threatening letter, he runs. He, he's running. I think he's running somewhere because the angel of the Lord will meet him on the way and he'll say this, he'll use this language, he'll say, the journey is too great for thee. If somebody just running helter-skelter, nowhere in mind, I wouldn't call that a journey. But if somebody's got a destination in mind, I would call that a journey. And we might get a little inkling as to where that destination is because Elijah will mention his father's. He'll say, I'm not better than my father's. And in the Jewish vernacular, Moses would have been one of Elijah's fathers. And Moses had seen God in the mountain. And I think that Elijah was trying to get to God. I think he felt if I could just get a glimpse of God, like Moses got a glimpse of God, I could go on. So he heads for the mountain. He doesn't make it. For a little while, he doesn't make it. And I'll say this to you. This is a whole other message. God met him halfway. You know how merciful God is? When you're looking for him and you can't get to him, he'll come to where you are and meet you along the way and give you what you need to get where he is. So Elijah gets to the mountain. There's a wind, there's a fire, there's an earthquake. God's not in any of those, but he's in a still small voice. In verse number 12, the Bible said, and after the earthquake, a fire but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out. We're in verse 13. And stood in the entering in of the cave, and behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. 
And when thou comest, anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elijah, the son of Shaphat, of Abel-Meholah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Haziel shall Jehu slay. And him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. Now I'm going to pray, and if the Lord will help me for a few minutes, I want to pray or preach on this thought. He is 7,000 times better than I thought he was. Father, would you help us in the next few moments to exalt your name and to glorify you? Because, Lord, I have learned over these years that if you get glory, your people will be helped, and we need help today. So you help us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I've had this on my heart today. I can't seem to get away from it, and I don't know why, but I'm going to preach it anyway. This morning it's just on my heart. I'm thinking about Elijah all the things that he has gone through. He says something very interesting here. He'll say, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. And then he'll say in the end of that verse in verse 14, I, even I only am left and they seek my life to take it away. And when I read what Elijah said, I think to myself, poor God, poor God, all he has is Elijah. Isn't that what he said? I, even I only am left. Lord, I've all you got. And Lord, if I don't get it done, it won't get done. So I'm looking at God and all of a sudden in this passage from Elijah's viewpoint, and it's always this way when you start using this language, I have. I have. Here's what I have done. In this passage, Elijah has made himself big. And every time you make yourself big, God becomes small. And so Elijah has come to the point where he says, this all depends on me. And God, if I don't get it done, it's hopeless for you. I'm afraid sometimes we feel that way. Our old friend, he's in heaven now by the name of Ray Aiken pastored the Rosman Baptist Tabernacle and I met him down in uh, North Carolina at WGCR and he would preach and he was an unusual man and when he would preach he would have these little sayings in the middle of the sermon and I got interested so I wrote them down I thought they ought to be uh, ought to be kept for posterity's sake and I remember one day he was preaching on pride and he stopped and he looked at us and he said, you'll be surprised how well things will go around here after you're gone. <laughs> but somehow we've gotten the idea the work depends upon us. Now I know, I know God wants us to serve and I want to serve and I want to be faithful, but I'm going to tell you the work does not depend on me. The work depends on the Lord. It is the Lord's work. He can use whom he wants to, when he wants to, how he wants to, in whatever way. And so I'm looking at Elijah, and I'm thinking that God is going to say to Elijah, because Elijah said, I have, but a little bit later, God will say, down in verse number uh, seven or verse number 18, God will say, I have. Elijah, stop thinking about what you have and start thinking about what I have. God will say, it's not about what you've done, Elijah. It's what I've done with you and what I can do. And what, it, what God is going to say to Elijah is, I am better than you think I am. I'm not minutely better. I'm not meagerly better. I'm not marginally better. As a matter of fact, Elijah, I am 7,000 times better than you think I am. I am 7,000. I am multiplied better than you think I am. You think the best thought you could think about God today, and you know what? He's better than that. You think him as big as you can think him this morning, and he's bigger than that. You think him as wise as you can think him this morning, and he's wiser than that. You think him as strong as you can think him this morning, and he's stronger than that. You think of him as gracious as you can think of him this morning, and he's got more grace than that. You think of him as merciful as you can think this morning, and he's more merciful than that. I'm saying to you, he's better 7,000 times at least. 
better than what we think he is. Now, I want to give you three thoughts about that this morning and then a little postscript. I want you to think, first of all, that God's work is more personal. It's more personal than we think it is. When you look in this passage, Elijah thinks that God is, uh, that he's all that God has. But here's what God said. God begins to mention people by name in response to Elijah, telling him that I've not just been working in your life, Elijah. I've been working in the lives of others. He talks about Haziel. He talks about Jehu. And he talks about Elisha. But then he'll say this. He'll say, I have 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal, nor hath their mouth kissed him. Now that interests me. How does God know there are 7,000 knees that have not bowed to Baal? How does God know that there are 7,000 mouths that have not kissed uh, uh, kissed Baal? Well, the only thing I can think is he's been watching everybody's knee and everybody's mouth. He's been in every home in Israel. He's been around every Israelite. He's heard every word. He's seen everything that's done. He's been personally involved in every one of these lives. He knows who your knees are bowing to. He knows who your mouth is kissed. And you know the picture that we're using here, the, sim, uh, the, sim, uh, uh, the symbol of it. You know, what, you know what I'm talking about. But he knows all about us. His work is personal in our lives. Elijah seemed to think that God was only interested in him and not in anybody else. But I'm glad God. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what you are. God is interested in your life, personally interested. He knows what you've been up to. He knows what you need. Need. He knows the need of your heart and the desires of your heart. He knows. He's a God that knows. Personally acquainted. And I noticed these three men that he mentions in our passage. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return unto thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Haziel. He's going to anoint Haziel to be king. So apparently God is personally at work in Haziel's life. Now, who was Haziel? Well, I won't go into all of his past, but I'll say this to you about him. I call him the shrewd man because Haziel was a man looking for an opportunity, and when the opportunity came, he took it. I don't know if it was the right thing, but he took it. And I thought to myself, here is a shrewd man, and then there's Jehu. I call him the sudden man. When you read about Jehu, he's a man who leaps before he looks. He's a man who speaks before he thinks. He's a man who's, he's the man who's always going to go. He's a lot like Peter in the New Testament. He's got a lot to say. Uh, and so there is Jehu, I call him the sudden man. And then there is Elisha, I call him the simple man. Because when we're introduced to him, you know where he is? He's out in the field plowing. He's a farmer. He's not involved and as far as I know has no aspirations to be a king and no aspirations even to be a prophet as far as we know. But God knows all three of these men. They are all different in their personality. They're different in their talents. They're different in their ability. And God said, I'm going to use all three of these men in my plan. Uh, you know, one writer said this. He said, God is after fish and he's got a lot of nets and all of them aren't woven the same and all of them don't have the same size and all of them are not the same length of handle, but they all catch fish, and what slips through one net, God gets in another net. And I want to say to you, friend, that's the way God is. He'll use you like you are, where you are, as you are. You don't have to be like somebody else. You don't have to preach like somebody else. You don't have to sing like somebody else. You just give your life to God. He'll use you. I was reading this morning about a man in England. I can't remember the name of the the name of the city, but he worked for God and served the Lord and did it for many years. And when he died, they lined the streets for his funeral. And somebody that did not know him came up and uh, said, who, uh, who is this funeral for? What's all this hullabaloo about? He said, well, this is about so-and-so that served the Lord. And he said, well, what was so important about him? And here's what they said. He was mighty thick with the Almighty. You say, preacher, I'd like to be used of God. You don't have to have a talent. You don't have to have some peculiar thing. Just get thick with the Almighty this morning. Just get close to God, and God will use you, whoever you are. His work is more personal than we think it is. How's the second one? His work is more profitable than we think it is. 
much more profitable. I want you to think about Elijah. Here's what he said. I even, I only am left. He said, there's nobody else. Now you think about a man that's been preaching and serving God in Israel, been the prophet of Israel. Elijah's feeling is that he's alone. He has, he has toiled, he has witnessed, he has suffered in vain. His preaching has been in vain. His testimony has been in vain. His life of faith and the prayers that he prayed have all been in vain. Isn't that what he's saying? Look at what, look Lord, I, there isn't anybody. I'm the only one. Everybody else wants to tear down your altars. Everybody else wants to be dead. Nobody loves you. It's all been in vain. You know what the devil will tell you? You haven't done anything for God. You haven't accomplished anything. You, you, uh, you come to a meeting like this and you want to get encouraged and the preacher gets up and said, yeah, well, I'm telling you, we had 1,500 souls saved this year. I didn't get encouraged because I didn't see 1,500 that I know about you come, I used to, I would come to a meeting like this, a young preacher, I'd get in and I'd think I was doing pretty good and the preacher would get up and he said, yeah, he said, uh, I read this and he quote half the Bible. And I think to myself, man, you don't know your Bible. And then they'd get up, somebody preach on giving and say, I give this much missions. And I think to myself, you are stingy. I'm talking about me. And then somebody would get up and they'd tell how much time they'd spend in prayer and I think to myself, I am backslid. I didn't pray. And you know what? I leave discouraged. I do want to pray more. I do want to give more. I do want to memorize more. I do want to, I do, want to do all those things. But I cannot measure what I do for God by what someone else has done. I must measure what I do for God by what he told me to do. What he, what he instructed me to do. I'm just saying to you, you say, well, preacher, I don't know if I've accomplished anything. Have you done the will of God? Have you been faithful? Moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. You can't always tell. And the matter, the truth of the matter is we won't know till we get to heaven what we've accomplished for the Lord. We will not know. I walked into a Salvation Army thrift store up in Michigan a couple years ago, and I noticed when I walked in the door, uh, this girl was behind the counter and she kind of gave me a funny look as I walked by and I didn't know what it was. I just sort of nodded and went on. I was looking for books. I found a lot of good books in there and I found a little something else and so I, I found, actually I found a piece of furniture that day and I took the little tag and I walked up to the counter and she's still there and I laid it on the counter and she looked at me and I looked at her and she said, you don't remember me, do you? I said, no ma'am, I'm sorry, I don't. And she told me her name and she said, I got saved at the Silvery Lane Baptist Church over in Dearborn Heights when you were preaching several years ago I said, well, how are you doing? She said, I'm living for God and serving the Lord. I didn't know one thing about it, not one thing about it. Like God let me know a little bit about it beforehand. I was preaching up in Michigan one time and uh, at the uh, Midwestern Old Fashioned Baptist Camp meeting and uh, this lady come up and she shook my hand and she gave me what I used to call a North Carolina handshake because the first time it ever happened to me, I was in North Carolina. She had money in her hand when she shook my hand. So she gave me a North Carolina handshake, and I just stuck it. I learned you're supposed to stick the money in your pocket and smile and say thank you. And she grinned, and before she said a word or I could say thank you, and she turned around and walked away. So the next night I'm up on the platform or getting ready for the service. She come walking up again. That day she gave me a Michigan handshake, no money in it. <laughs> and she shook my hand, and she grinned at me and smiled, and I, I said, uh, thank you, ma'am. And she said, uh, you don't know who I am, do you? I said, No. She said, you was preaching at the Grace Bible Church. She told me how many years ago it had been. And she said, on one night, my son came and he got born again in the service. And the next night, my husband came and he'd been saved, but he got his heart right and surrendered his life. And she I think it had been eight years. She said, we have planted, we're in church planting. She said, we planted eight churches since my husband got right with the Lord in that service. I didn't know one thing about it. Now listen, here's what I'm saying to you. You don't know what you've accomplished for the Lord. You don't know what your testimony is is done. You don't know. Here's what God said. Hey, Elijah, I've got 7,000. As far as I can tell, Elijah didn't know one thing about those 7,000 that loved God. Not one thing, but how, where did they come from? Do you remember when Jonah preached? He got a halfway, a half day's journey through the city and he preached. And then a little while later, we read that the king heard what he'd said. 
and the king called a fast and, and he proclaimed the fast and they put on sackcloth and ashes. Apparently, uh, if as far as I can figure out, the king never heard him preach, but word of what he preached got to the king and the king repented. I don't know. Uh, where do you reckon these 7,000 have heard the truth of the word of God? They must have heard it through Elijah. He just told us he's the only one preaching it. He didn't know anything about that 7,000. You don't know anything about those that have been born again, those that have been saved, those whose lives have been changed because of your faithfulness. I was in, I was in North Carolina preaching and I had this friend named Horace Minton. Horace, if you're from Michigan, and Horace, if you're from North Carolina. And Brother Horace always wanted to go soul winning, but he always did it in a way that got me in trouble. So one day I said to him, what are we doing today? He said, we're going soul winning. I said, okay. He, he said, we're going to, and he named a college campus. And I said, okay. He said, there's just one problem. I said, what's that? I knew there was some problem. There always was. I said, what's that? He said, it's illegal. I said, that's a problem. He said, but here's what I found out. I've been reading the handbook of the college. It's illegal to solicit but you can take a survey. So we went to the Ben Franklin. We got us pens and clipboards and pencils and paper, and we wrote us out a 10-question survey. Is there a God? Is there a heaven? Is there a hell? How can I miss hell and go to heaven? Who was Jesus? What did he do? Those were our questions. So we went all over that college that day taking a survey talking to people about Jesus. I sat, I, he was talking to two fellows. There was this lady sitting, young lady sitting by herself over uh, in the cafeteria. And so I walked over and I laid down my clipboard where she could see it because I wanted, by the way, when we walked onto the campus, two security guards came up to see what we were doing. Brother Horace, I stood behind him because it was his idea. He said, we're here to take a survey. We showed him our clipboard. They said, go ahead. So I laid that thing down where she could see it, and I said, um, young lady, I'm taking a survey. Can I ask you some questions? She said, sure you can. I said, is there a God? She said, oh, I don't think so. She said, I said, is there a heaven? She said, maybe. I said, is there a hell? She said, definitely not. I said, who is Jesus? She said, hold it. Just like that. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, you're asking me questions, questions about Christianity, aren't you? I said, yes, ma'am. And I was ready. I was bolstering myself for the attack. But her face got, her features got calm and her eyes got a little bit wet. She said, if there ever was such a thing as a Christian, my granny was a Christian. She said, granny would be on her knees praying when I'd come to her house and she'd be calling out my name. She said, granny would walk through the house singing Christian songs. That's what she called them. I, could, I did not lead that girl to the Lord that day. I talked to her. I tried. But I'm going to tell you one thing. If she does go to hell, she's going to have to go over Granny's testimony. She's going to have to go over what Granny taught her and what Granny said. And Granny's been in heaven a long time. I don't know if Granny knew what a difference she'd made in that young lady's life, how she could not get past the fact that once in her life she had known a real Christian. Once in her life. I'm just saying to you, you do not know what God has done. His, his work is more profitable than you think. We had a missionary named Brother Miller from our church. He preached in South America, and he went down, and he was preaching, and he led some people to the Lord. And then his wife got ill, and he had to come back to the States. He prayed for those people and thought about them and looked for the day when he could go back. And finally, the Lord let him go back, and he came back to that little village where he'd been ministering, and he found that those people had led other people to Christ. And in the midst of leading other people to Christ, one of them had surrendered to preach, and they built them a building, and they had a church and a preacher. And he got so excited, he went running around the building. He was doing laps around the building, shouting, Hallelujah, glory to God. He was beside himself. A couple of days later, there was a group of natives from another village came over. They wanted to see the American missionary. And so when they came, they said to him, We are saved. We are Christians also. We've been led to Christ by these that you led to Christ. And we have a church also, and we want you to come and dedicate our building. 
He said, what do you mean dedicate your building? They said, like you did theirs. They thought that's the way we dedicated our churches in the United States of America. We got together and ran around the building and shouted hallelujah, glory to God. And I'm not so sure it's a bad idea. I'm just saying to his work is more profitable than you think it is. God uses a number here, the number seven. It's the number of completion. It's the number of perfection. I don't want you to leave here discouraged this morning. I, want you, I don't want you to leave and say, well, I haven't done what so-and-so did or I didn't do this or that didn't get done. Just do what God tells you to do and you'll be found faithful in the sight of the Lord and you'll be a success in the eyes of God. And then there's going to be rewards in heaven you don't even know about. God, God is so kind and gracious to give me a little taste along the way. Somebody does that with you, doesn't he? Some want to come by. But when we get to heaven and find out, here's a third thing and my last thing. God's work is more personal than you think it is. His work is more profitable than you think it is. And his work is more powerful than we think it is. I want you to notice there's another number in this passage. He said, yet I have left me seven. There's one number, that number of completion. But then there's this number thousand. Thousand. That's a number that occurs often in the Bible. I had throat surgery, some of you know, earlier in the year. And on Thursday, I had throat surgery. And on Friday, my pastor called and his wife was very ill. And he said, I'm going to have to take Mary to the uh, emergency ward and so, or the emergency room. And so my wife and daughter and I, because we didn't want him to have to go alone, we packed up. So I went back to the hospital the next day. And we spent the night in the emergency room, and my wife was in the room with the preacher and his wife, and I was out there in the waiting room, and I was just looking around, and I'm not supposed to talk. I, I'm, I'm, it's, it's supposed to be like 10 or 14 days. I'm not supposed to say a word. Do you know how hard that is for a preacher? <laughs> One of my preacher friends, can I tell you a story? One of my preacher friends had throat surgery, so they bought him a, a, a marker, one of those marker boards, and so he could write his questions. So he went to the store and he wrote his question. And before he wrote the question, he said, I have had throat surgery. I'm not allowed to speak. Can you help me with this? And the lady took it and she read it. And then she erased it and wrote him back an answer. <laughs> so he wiped it off and wrote down, I can't talk, but I can hear. <laughs> so I'm sitting in the waiting room. We've left in a hurry. There's not much I can do. I can't talk to anybody. So the television is on, and there's a fellow on there, and he's preaching, sort of. And he wasn't doing too bad. He's talking about the gospel, and that was good, talking about Jesus and the blood, and that was all good. It was obvious he had people staged out through the auditorium that were supposed to say amen at a certain time, raise their hand at a certain time. They'd been paid to do so. But he still was giving the gospel out, and I was glad about that, and then he got on this number 1,000. He said, the number 1,000 is found throughout the Bible, and he said, you know what 1,000 is in the Bible? It's God's seed number. He said, you know what sowing seed is? It's giving. And he said, I believe the reason God put me on this text was because he wants you to sow seed in my ministry. And 1,000 is God's seed number. Well, 1,000 is not God's seed number. But it is a number that has significance in our Bible. Can you think of a verse? Can you think of a verse? One come right on top of your head, I'm sure, where God uses this number 1,000 in a very significant way in the New Testament. How about this? I wrote it down. Be not ignorant of this one thing. That a day is as a thousand years with the Lord and a thousand years as a day. So I'm looking at this number thousand. Here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that God's work, God is so powerful in his work that he is unfazed by the expanse of time. It don't bother him. We just heard it when our brother preached. We pray and we want an answer right now. And if we didn't get our answer right now, we say God's not listening. But God is not bound by time. He's going to do it when it's right. He's going to do it when it's appropriate. 
He's going to do it when it'll do the best for the glory of God and the best for you and I. He's going to work at his own time pace and his own time schedule. I was preaching one time about getting on schedule with God. And in the middle of the service, a young evangelist friend that I had, in the middle of the preaching, he got up and walked out. I thought he was mad. After the service, he came up and said, I'm sorry I walked out, but you talked about getting on God's time schedule, and God reminded me of a man I wasn't right with, and God said, go take care of it right now. And so I got up and went out and called him and took care of it right now. God is not on our time schedule, but because something takes time does not mean that God didn't do it or isn't going to do it or didn't hear about it. He's not phased by time. Here's another one. Let me read this one to you. Joshua 23, 10, one of man, one man of you shall chase a thousand. For the Lord your God, he is it that fighteth for you as he has promised you. So apparently the extent of the enemy doesn't bother God. Doesn't bother him how many are against us. Doesn't bother him how many are fighting. Doesn't bother him. Sometimes you feel like you're surrounded, but you and I need to learn what Elisha's servant learned, that the enemy is the one surrounded by the chariots and the host of God. God's power goes beyond numbers. Then there's this one. I like this one. This one's my favorite. Deuteronomy 1.10. Listen to what Moses said to the children of Israel. The Lord your God hath multiplied you. And behold, ye are this day as the stars of heaven for multitude. Now, that's a lot of folks. You're like the stars of heaven. But watch the next verse. The Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times so many more as ye are. Would you think about that a moment? Moses said, I've looked you over. God started with Abraham, but he's made you in number like the stars of heaven. But he said, here's what I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray that God will make you a thousand times more than what you are right now. That, that seems like a pretty big request to me. Does it to you? You ever had a request like that? Moses didn't see, he didn't choke on it when he said it. He didn't say, you know, I don't know if God's able to do this, but I'm going to ask him anyway. He didn't put any preface to it. He didn't look for any way out to escape it. He just said, here's what I'm going to pray. The Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times so many more. You say, oh, preacher, I got a big request. Well, let me tell you about a God who's 7,000 times at least bigger than you think he is. He is not, he is not uh, bothered. He is, not, he is unfazed by the enormity of the request. You say, I got a big need. Well, you got a bigger God. I got a big problem. You got a bigger God. I need a big dose of mercy. He's a God. God with plenteous in mercy. I need a big dose of grace. He is filled up with grace. I'm just saying to you, friend, he's bigger than you think he is. I'll, say, I'll tell you this. He's unfazed by the efforts of the enemy because one day he's going to take the devil and throw him in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. I say, oh, preacher, what do we do with all this? Here's what we do. If you're a helpless sinner this morning, and you say, I don't know if I can be saved. I want to tell you, God has more mercy than you think he has. How much more? Well, if we're going to stick with our text, about 7,000 times more than what you think. If you know somebody that's lost, you say, preacher, they, they can't ever get saved. God is more merciful than you think he is. And then secondly, if you're weary and a servant of God and you just think, oh, I, just, I just don't know if I can keep going. I don't know if I can go on. I just don't know. I want to say, God... He's better than you think he is. He's got more power than you think he is. He's got more patience than you think he has. And he's gathering more fruit than you can possibly imagine. And one of these days when we get to heaven, we'll find out what we have accomplished for the Lord. By the power of the Lord, he gets the glory. But we'll find out what we've accomplished. So if you're weary, you're worn, you say, Preacher, I just don't know if I'm getting anywhere. Well, Use that little phrase, don't know, because that's the truth. You don't know whether you're getting anywhere or not. But God knows, so just stay by the stuff. Just stay with it. Just be faithful. Stay with God. And if you're helpless in your suffering, God has more comfort than you think he has. He's the God of all comfort. And he'll comfort you. I want you to bow your heads a moment. Heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. I got a few minutes. I'm going to tell you this story. Darlene Dibler and her husband were missionaries in the Pacific, one of those islands. At the beginning of the Second World War, they were captured by the enemy, by the Japanese. She was put in a prison camp on one side of the island. He was put in a prison camp on the other side of the island. 
She never saw him again. The only thing she ever knew about him was that somebody brought a handwritten or hand-drawn picture of his grave. She never saw her husband again. She was in that, she was in that uh, camp and the commandant was, he was abusive. He, he was angry. And when she'd come into his presence, she had to come in bowed. She had to be careful what she said or she'd be beaten. They tortured and starved those women, treated them terribly. But whenever she could, she would say a word about Jesus to that commandant, and sometimes it cost her dearly. She was rescued at the end of the war. She married a man. His last name was Rose, Darlene Dibler Rose. That commandant was captured and put in, he's tried for military crimes, put in prison. He got out of prison as an old man. One day a man was riding a bike on one of those islands in Japan. and He stopped at a little store and when he went in there was an aged man standing there and they got into conversation. And they got talking about the war and then they got talking about Jesus. Then they got talking about Darlene Dibler Rose. And that man said to him, I was the commandant of the camp. I went to prison for what I've done. And he said, do you ever see any of those women that were in my camp? And the man said, no, but I've heard of them. He said, if you ever see them, will you tell them I'm sorry for what I did? And tell them that I am a changed man. Not long after that, Darlene Dibler Rose heard a recorded testimony of that commandant how he had given his life to Christ because of her testimony. She had no idea what she had accomplished for God. You may have no idea. Let's just stay by the stuff. He's better than we think he is. He's doing more than we think he is. He's bigger than we think he is. Much bigger, much better, and much more. Father, help us now in this invitation. There may be somebody, Lord, discouraged. There may be somebody thinking about throwing in the towel. There may be somebody, Lord, they're not discouraged in the sense of being depressed about themselves, but they just feel like they haven't accomplished what they could have or what they should have. I pray this morning, Lord, you might get big in their eyes, and it'll be less about what they have and more about what you have. And I pray this morning somebody say, I believe I just go on. I believe I just keep serving. I believe I just trust the Lord. Maybe somebody needs to get right with God this morning. They don't think they can. They don't think there's any hope for somebody like them. Maybe they think they've gone too far. I pray they might see you're more merciful than than they think. I just pray you'll help us today. Show yourself mighty and strong and have your way in our lives and get glory out of our lives. Help us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand a moment, will you? preacher's going to come here in a moment. Our sister's going to play and sing. Maybe God spoke to your heart and you need to come. Bow the knee this morning. There's a big God waiting for you at the altar. He's waiting for you. He wants you to come and say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to keep on. I'm going to stay by the stuff. I'm going to do something for your honor and for your glory. You come while she sings.